Hi everyone, so excited to be here, just popping on live really quick and um, have a special guest. This was um, a special interview that I wanted to do with an incredible friend of mine, um, Pastor Derwin Gray. Some of you may have seen the live that I did with him this morning on his Instagram channel, and I thought the conversation was so good. I wanted to make sure to have him on my channel today. So let's see, we're about to go live here. I'm going to add Irwin, and uh, he should be popping on any minute now. Well, there he is. Hey, how are you, friend? I'm so good. How are you? You know, I am doing great. I'm still uh, just basking in the awesomeness from our live this morning over on my channel. And so uh, thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, my, my entire staff at Transformation Church was just, uh, we were grateful. There were tears. We really felt like, man, God, God is doing something. And so, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, I loved being on your channel this morning. I considered it such an honor that you would have me. And um, I do want to tell people there's a reason for our conversation today. Um, I've got two reasons, and I would love to state those so that everyone knows this will be a great investment of their time. Our goal is to go about 20 minutes. So if you are needing to cook dinner, ask your people, throw them a snack and ask your people to wait 20 minutes. It will be worth your time, right? Uh, but there's two reasons why we're doing this today. Number one is Pastor Derwin is an incredible friend. He is on the board at Proverbs 31 Ministries. So we do ministry together. We've known each other. How long have we known each other? I mean, that was probably back in 2000, 2001. So we're looking at two decades. Yes. So about 20 years. So basically, we knew each other when we were in kindergarten. That's what we're going <laughs> to Because we don't. That's right. Right. We've been friends for a long time. I love your wife, Vicki. She is an incredible woman. Um, and, uh, I wanted to make sure to have you on today because you've written a book. Can you show us all? Yes. And this is a big week because the good life is releasing. And I want people to know about this book. Look with your smiley face right beside. Oh, hey, I am. I am. You know, I've never given physical birth, but man, this was given spiritual birth. And for the record, you were a nursemaid and given birth because of your compelled training and your uh, just wisdom and insight. So I'm hoping some of that Lisa Turkhurst pixie dust can touch this book. <laughs> don't tell people I was in the birth room, okay? Let's just don't <laughs> too far. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about your book, but also I want to um, give both of us an opportunity to speak into something that is causing a lot of heartbreak, a lot of heartbreak. And um, I know a lot of you have probably seen many, many social media posts about um, just another tragic display of life loss and racism. And um, my daughter and I were talking about it first thing this morning, Derwin, and we couldn't even talk. This is such a personal issue to us. Obviously, I'm a white woman, but I've got two black sons that um, I love very much. And so when my daughter and I were processing this, we could not, we couldn't even get the words out because it feels so deeply personal what if it could have been, you know, Mark or Jackson, these two boys that I've loved for 20 years. And, um, and I know, Derwin, that this issue is very personal to you. You lead an incredible church, Transformation Church, here in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is a multi-ethnic church. You do a tremendous job of speaking into issues like this. So I also want to give you an opportunity to um, speak into this from a pastor's 
uh, viewpoint, but also just from your own life experiences. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, the first thing that I want to say is what we've seen take place in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where uh, the gentleman was no threat. There were three other guys on top of him, and a police officer put his knee on the black man's neck, his face slammed on the ground. He's saying, I can't breathe. Somebody help me. He even cried out to his mom. And he did that for seven minutes. Um, I, I spoke to a chief of police today. And I, I said, is there any training for this? And he said, absolutely not. Okay. And so what I want to say is that as a African-American man growing up in San Antonio, Texas, on the west side, the aspects of police brutality, and there are so many great police, right? But the aspect of police brutality is nothing new to the black community. Um, I have received tons of texts, tons of like phone calls, and I'm saying, we've been saying this. I mean, I'm 49, and so we've been, I, I've been saying it for, 49 years and we've got the civil rights. And so um, this aspect of systemic injustice towards black men is nothing new. Now, as a pastor, I want to talk to my brothers and sisters in Christ who are white. Um, the days of being silent, um, the days of being, um, well, that's not my issue. No, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself means this. I care about what hurts you. Um, so I've got a, a fairly good reputation in Charlotte, but even I've been profiled. Even I've had run-ins. But once they find out, oh, you're Derwin Gray, you're the marinade on that guy. But there's, but not everybody has my position. Not everybody has my privilege. And so what we're, we're saying is I expect the unbelieving world to act a certain way. But brothers and sisters in Christ have got to have each other's backs and, and say, what hurts you hurts me. And you as a mom of two African-American young men, you feel the weight of that. Like, Getting your kids to drive, you, you know, it's kind of like, oh, man, man, they could have a wreck. And in my mind, wreck is only a little part of it. I have to go through, okay, if you get stopped, you always have your insurance and your driver's license right here. You have your wallet right here. You put your hands on the dashboard. You don't move quick. You say, yes, sir, no, sir. And that was one of the saddest days of my life, having to tell my son that. And my son is three inches taller than me. He's 220 pounds. And he's the most gentle, loving person that I know other than my wife. Uh, but he fits a stereotype. Yeah. And so we're asking for the church, particularly my white brothers and sisters, to say, you know what? We need to come alongside and say the gospel which is the good news. Good news brings about justice. Jesus came to preach the good news to the poor, to the captive, the blind, the oppressed. That's not only spiritually, but that's also physically. And what's beautiful is there is a sense of joy and purpose with God when we have solidarity with the hurting and the marginalized. Oh. And Derwin, I think part of what makes this so painful is that um, it's been said for a long time, but I know a moment this morning that was so important for me to have with you is to say, Derwin, I believe you. And I'm not gonna try to unpack what was the full story, what were all the questions, what were the surrounding things. I just wanna say, I what you're referring to, and I believe you. And I am so sorry that it has taken videos and cameras and pictures to show the world what you've been seeing for a long time. And yeah. I, I just think it's so important to start the conversation there 
and to say, are the, are the circumstances at times complicated? Yes, but that doesn't negate that we don't recognize it. That, that doesn't mean that we try to overcomplicate the situation because in my estimation with my boys, this is, this is not a black and white issue. It's a human issue. It's a human issue. And when my boys fall down and they scrape their knee, they bleed the same as when I fall down and I scrape my knee. And it's so important for us to bring to the conversation, we are humans and even in our dynamic, we are Christians. Like we've got to make sure that this, we acknowledge it and we do something about it. Absolutely. And so as a, as a pastor, as a man that loves Jesus, the gospel, the church, um, and I say this lovingly, I say this respectfully, but I have to say it, the predominantly white church has not discipled its congregation in issues of racism and issues of justice. Um, that's been a conversation that is devoid. So when I would go speak at conferences, you know, hey, well, let's don't talk about the controversial things. And I'm, I'm going, I can't afford to not gospel controversial things because there are people who look like me and there may be people who perpetrate things against people who look like me. I was speaking in Oklahoma. This is within the last year. And I was speaking to a church planters gathering and it was pretty much older white pastors. And so I'm there. It seems like it's going good. I go to the restroom and I notice when I'm walking out of the restroom, an older white man, he, he's looking at me like he wants to say something. So he stops me and he says, hey, uh, I want to apologize to you. And, and I said, why? He goes, well, I was reading your book, Limitless Life, and I was enjoying it until I found out that you were black. And this is, this is within the last year. And so my first response is, take a step back. Take a step back. I am a Christian how someone feels about me does not determine my love for, for, for them, how God feels about me does. So I embraced him and hugged him, and I whispered in his ear, brother, I forgive you, because how could I not when Jesus has forgiven me? Wow. And, and that was a moment to say, listen, let the love of God heal your heart. And one of the beautiful things that you have because you have black sons is proximity breeds intimacy. In to me, you see. So when you actually see the other, it changes things. Uh, my wife, Vicky, is a white girl from Montana. Her stepdad was a mountain man from Montana. When I met him at 18 years old, he didn't like me. And I didn't like him. <laughs> and when we got married, I don't know how happy he was, but let me tell you this. When Vicky and I came to Christ, we literally locked that man in a room and Vicky with tears led him to Christ. And that relationship changed. And that man was so proud of me. We became best friends. When we would go to Montana, I couldn't even rest because he was introducing everybody to me. Come see my son. He's a pastor. I mean, he was so proud of me. But what happened, though? Proximity breeds intimacy. And so one of the beauties and geniuses of a multi-ethnic church is it's hard to hate somebody up close. It's hard to hate so someone you serve communion with, that you're in, in, a, in a life group with. But then not only just individual sin, Lisa, we have to also understand systemic sin. So case in point, uh, throughout the United States of America, cities were built on what's called redlining. Redlining means this. Cities were drawn out and there were red lines around areas where African Americans could only live. So that's the only places they could receive loans. So technically, you could be a person that's against racism, but the policies of the system would say, no, you can only give these loans or you get fired. And so we have to begin to think about tearing down the structures of racism, not just individually, but also systemically, that those are demonic strongholds and strong towers that have to be torn down, not by superstars, not by celebrities, but people with willing and loving hearts who say enough is enough and Jesus and his blood is worth it.
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for taking time to have this conversation. And you have written this incredible book called The Good Life. And um, I am so excited about this book because I truly think this is the most profound writings I've ever encountered. I've told you this many times about one of the most important sermons that uh, maybe even we've misunderstood for a long time. And it may seem like, wow, we're taking a sharp turn here from this hard topic of racism to a book that has a bright yellow cover. Uh, but it's not a sharp turn at all, right? But, uh, you talk about in this book, you take the Sermon on the Mount and you break it down to this isn't just blessed are the broken in heart or blessed are the broken in spirit, but you actually do a profound teaching that this is happiness. And I love what you've taught, but there's a chapter in the book, the very last is blessed are the persecuted, where you address this issue that we've been talking about very specifically. And you come right out of the gate and just use um, a different way of teaching the Bible to address racism and persecution in such a beautiful way that I want to say, if you've been asking the question today, what can I do? I want to say thank you for listening to this interview, but this isn't a book to read one day. This is a book to read two day. And this is one thing you can do. You can go buy this book and read the wisdom that Pastor Derwin has because part of participating in the conversation is to seek to understand before being understood. And I love the way you help us not only better understand the Bible, but better understand the issues that we've been talking about today as well. So tell us a little bit about your book. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, in essence, what I've tried to do is that we are all seeking happiness but we think that happiness deals with things that we accomplish, that we acquire. And Jesus is inviting us to sit at his feet, um, to look in his eyes of grace. And he wants to teach us that happiness is not so much about good things happening to you. It's about God literally making us good. And so our happiness is not predicated upon externals. Our happiness now is rooted in the internal, eternal reality of God's love who's shaping us. And, and so the Beatitudes, happy are the merciful, happy are the, all those beautiful happiness is a living portrait that Jesus says, this is what you could be. This is what I am. Let me live in you. Let me live through you. And let me do this through you so that you can find the happiness you were created for. But here's something even more profound. Your happiness leads to your holiness, that holiness and happiness are two sides of the same coin. Holiness is not about what you can't do. Holiness is more about what God has created you to do, and that is to beautifully reflect him. And in reflecting him, there's a happiness that transcends good circumstances. It's a, it's a happiness that's purposeful. Oh, I love that. And I know at the very end of the book, um, you and I talked about this, and it's a, it's a happiness manifesto that you've written. And I definitely want you to be able to read that as we close up our time together. But before you do that, Pastor Derwin, I just want to say I also am so grateful for the work that Transformation Church is doing. I think you are making an incredible impact, not only here in the Charlotte mm -hmm. area, but around the world, and you have some very specific initiatives that you are uh, doing here in our city. And so I want to encourage people to go online and look at Transformation Church. We always say support the local body where you go to church, but we also want to be kingdom minded. And when we see people doing a good work, and today is a great day to support some of the work that you're doing. I am making a gift to Transformation Church today. I'm so excited. And um, I just want to encourage all my brothers and sisters watching, please support Derwin and the important work that he's doing through Transformation Church. What is the website? 
It is transformationchurch.tc, transformationchurch.tc. And for the person that's asking, what's the name of the book? It's called The Good Life, right, What Jesus Teaches About Finding True Happiness. Hold up the book. Um, yes. It's called The and- Good Life. And um, I think there are going to be parts of the book that are going to surprise you, shake you, um, wake you up, and uh, give you some of the best, richest teaching on this incredible Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached that I have ever heard. And I've said that from the very first time I read your book. I've been telling you for a long time, this is not just a needed message, it's a right now message. And I'm so grateful it's now available to the public. So the second thing you can do besides giving a gift to Transformation Church is to buy the book, The Good Life. It's available wherever books are sold. And let's end today, Pastor Duren, with reading the Happiness Manifesto and then just say a prayer over us. Absolutely. And so at the end of the book, there's a Happiness Manifesto. And this is the way to daily affirm Uh, the truth of what Christ has done for you. And so it's an honor and privilege. And I just pray this as a blessing over everyone watching. I, Derwin Gray, declare that all I would ever hope to be is found in all of who Jesus is. My life is hidden in his life. His life is my life. As a gift of grace, Jesus lived a sinless life because I couldn't. In his unending mercy, Jesus died to death I should have to atone for my sin. Today, I am free from the power of sin and death. Because of his great love for me, I am holy, blameless, righteous, adopted child of God. I'm pleasing to the Father because I am in his beloved Son. The happiness I seek can never be satisfied by created things. The happiness I was created to experience is not found in happenings. True happiness is more about God making me good than good things happening to me. Today, I declare I choose happiness because I choose Jesus, his kingdom, and his glory. Today, I declare that I choose the ways of his kingdom, the truth of his gospel, and live from his life. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Pastor Derwin, do you mind if I pray over you? Hold your book up one more time. I want everyone to see it. And then let me wrap up our time. I just want to pray. God, please bless Pastor Derwin and his church. Bless my friend who loves you from the depths of his soul. Bless this book, Lord. Get it into the hands of all of us who desperately need it. And Lord, I pray that we would all today collectively raise our voices loud and say, God help us, enough is enough. We declare that racism must be defeated. Lord, we declare right now that it is the purity of our hearts that need to be brought forth, Lord. Let you speak to our hearts so that we know what to do and what to say. And God, please help us. And please help my precious black sisters and brothers, my own two sons, God. Protect them, heal them, comfort them. (laughs) Holy name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you, my sister. You have a a wonderful night. I love you, Derwin, give my love. Love you you too. Bye-bye. I'll be over there fishing. You better. I'll be watching for you. All right. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.